Hey, good morning and welcome to another debrief, this time from the Moscow Boulder and Speed World Cup. Uh, good morning, John. It is Monday morning. We're like 12 hours removed from uh, from my nap watching semifinals. It's like, yes. this is a hard schedule when they're, uh, when they're in this part of the world, man. Yeah, it's a big, uh, we were just talking before we pressed record here that it's, over in Russia, it's when they're, when these comps are in Russia, it's it's wake up really early before before sunrise, watch the semis, then you get a couple hours before the finals. Uh, it's a lot of for me and probably a lot of other people. It's a lot of staring at a little laptop live stream. Yeah, I so. like I woke up for four o'clock and watched about like fifteen minutes of it, and then I gave up and just ah. slept until nine. And I didn't know this about YouTube, but it's got uh like you can change the playback speed now. So you can like watch things at like one and a half times or two times speed, which is amazing for semis because you know, we, we never end up actually talking about every single result through semifinals. So just getting to see who tops and hearing what the commentators are talking about. It's a quick way to like get through it. So it's not, not actually that bad. I'm really, you know, it's a good little feature for YouTube to have. But, yeah, uh, that's, that's smart. I'm always afraid that if I don't watch it live, that it might just, I don't know, disappear. It might not get posted. You know, the replay might not get posted yeah, for another day I'm, or two. I'm worried about that for China. Cause you never know what the stream situation is going to be in like two weeks. So that's, that's one where we'll have to find out when they're, uh, when they're streaming those, those could be even harder for sure. Yeah. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah. How did you, uh, how did you enjoy it? Like, let's, let's start out by just kind of talking about our, our national teams again. How did things go for team USA? Yes. Uh, so, you know, things went okay. I think if you, I mean, so just in terms of results, there were two Americans that made it into the semifinals. Um, Natalia Grossman and and Kyra Condi. Uh, I have it written down here. Let's see. Condi was um, she placed 16th, and Natalia was 17th, tied for 17th, I think. Um, and then you know, none, neither one advanced to the finals. No men made it into the semifinals. Uh, so and Nathaniel but, Coleman wasn't even at this one, right? Like he was the best chance, but he wasn't even here. Right. He was not here. And he uh, the other American. We'll just go through it here. I have it written down. The other Americans. Uh, so Sienna Kopf was she tied for 21st. So she got in the top 30 as well for the women. And Alex Johnson was uh, tied for 25th. And um, Sierra Blair Coyle was 45th in the men. Uh, Zach Gala had the highest place with 27th. And then Drew Ruana was 41st. Joe Goodicker was 49th. Uh, Josh Levin was 70th and John Brosler was 74. So, so it kind of, uh, you know, there was a pretty wide range there, but there were several that were in the top 30. Um, they'll get their points towards the overall season, like Boulder world cup ranking or whatever. So I guess that's not like, it's not too bad. Yeah. And you know, if you look at just how the Americans have done in the past in the Russia world cup, it's not a, it's not traditionally a, a setting where the Americans shine uh, or China for that matter, either with the upcoming uh, competitions. But so if you would, if you would, if you were to graph the um, kind of the performance over the years in, in Russia, I, I think this probably kind of aligns to where you would expect them to, how you would expect them to perform. Um, you know, having several in the top 30 is, is great. So, um, yeah, sure. so I, you know, I think it's just kind of what I expected, to be honest. Yeah, it was it was roughly the same for like Canadians. Sean was thirty third, I think, if I remember right, and then Alana made it to semis. Um, she barely got into semis; like she qualified in in what twentieth. So she came out with yeah. Adam Andra, which is like another story. Um, his placing, but so she came in last place going into se or not last place, qualified last into uh, into semifinals. And I mean, watching because she was out first, just watching her getting like wrecked by these problems. I was super concerned, but then it turned out to be like the hardest semifinal that I've seen in uh, in a while, uh, much harder than at least like uh, the Maringen one. Um, and she ended up in ninth place. So that ended mm -hmm. up being a great result for her. Um, and Sean only missed, uh, semis by what, like a zone. Like he was so close to Andra's score him. And I think two or three other guys could have knocked out Andra with, with an extra zone. So really not that far off from everything, even though, you know, I still think of Sean as a guy that's in the top 10 all the time. This wasn't that bad compared to his like typical results. So, you know, it'll, it's fine. 
Yeah, and I think watching the the route setting, which is a whole other topic that you know, I don't know if we want to get there quite yet. But oh, yeah. we'll, but we'll but see. looking at the route setting for the finals for the men and the women, I mm-hmm. think the, the style of those problems was it, probably something that Alana and Sean both would have done really well at. Yeah, uh, that, that's like a, a unique thing. It was it did feel like the. You know, and it's, I'm finding it really hard to make really good comparisons between semis and finals because the environment feels so different. Like even just through the spectator lens where there's so much going on in semis, you don't get a chance to watch every single attempt. So you have a hard time really getting a sense of how climbers evolve through each problem. But like, I mean, the the, the finals I thought were for the most part, like really good problems, particularly for the men. Um, semis was felt like it was a, a notably different kind of uh kind of setting style at least visually but again like i'm just a pleb spectator so i see like it's in the dark and there's a spotlight and suddenly i think it's all different but um yeah i don't know it uh they could have done well maybe not but semifinals was a bit of a you know uh uh, a breaker for them but that's okay but uh Mm -hmm. but yeah like andra andra was wild just barely getting into to semis and then managing to turn it all the way around and qualify out first um, that was, I think that was my like biggest surprise of, uh, of the Boulder event was just his, his barely making it into semifinals. Yeah. And that's kind of what I, 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 that's sort of how I expected him to be this season, or at least at the start of this season. I think he, he kind of surprised everybody by, I mean, not everybody, but he surprised a lot of us who followed the competition scene, uh, by winning last week because, uh, you know, it's just kind of easy to think because he's been doing all these outdoor, you know, sort of high profile uh, projects and whatnot. It was kind of easy to think that it might take him a couple of events mm-hmm. before he he kind of finds his rhythm. Um, so he might have some up and down rounds. Uh, and yet he he won last week. I think so just from seeing his like Road to Tokyo video series in my head, I've been like, yeah, he's been gearing up for this for like a year. His priorities are a hundred percent on indoor climbing. So I like I haven't been. I feel like I haven't been a surprise. I feel like this guy is like drilled, and this is all he wants right now um, is uh, is to be good at this. And it was funny kind of watching him like flail away at uh, at some stuff. It was really interesting, but yeah, it was. And I think you know part of that part of why I'm thinking maybe. He, I know he's been doing these outdoor projects is because he released all these videos of, I think they were called like Climbing the Americas or something like that, where he was trying to go around and on-site all of these American test pieces. Uh, th- that was just, I mean, they were just released not that long ago, but who knows when they were actually filmed. Sure, know, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, aside from Andra, I think that like the the only two like really big disappointments that I wanted to point out were were Mikhail Mawam and and Rei Sugimoto because they like they got all five tops in qualifiers and then they just couldn't top anything in semis. Like I thought they were gonna crush through, and I was really excited to see like Mawam. He's just an exciting climber. Um, as I mentioned, like last week, he's and Rei Sugimoto as well. He's just a smiley dude. I, I like seeing those guys in finals, but semifinals destroyed them. Man, it was uh, yeah. And, and and Jakob didn't uh, he didn't Jakob Schubert didn't qualify didn't make it out of qualifiers either if I remember yeah no he didn't right and, yeah though, I was a little bit excited that Jan Hoyer might actually get through to finals because uh, I I kind of miss seeing like tall like tall guys represent in finals yeah. I just like watching him climb a little bit I feel like he's one of the dudes that can break beta compared to some other guys but but yeah anyway it was all right I guess mm-hmm. um, speed wise I'm just gonna bring up speed like not that I know a ton about speed i'm trying to learn more but it was a really good weekend for the canadians both alana and sean set personal bests um i think sean had just set a personal best like in innsbruck a couple days earlier when he was training so not not like a um it's not crazy news but it shows improvement on them for speed and it's kind of a good sign because it's putting them in in like an actually reasonable area of the speed things and i'd say he's kind of the most notable non-native speed climber up there like he's beating kind of the other guys that are seeing themselves as as recently converted combined athletes and then same thing for elena yip who got a new personal best but also broke the canadian speed record so we finally have a record that's sub 10 seconds finally um but again, for her, she, she finished what thirty third. Uh, so yeah, that's that's really uh, that's a good sign for me. Even though she might not be getting the finals that she wants, you know, mm-hmm. whether or not she should expect it, but she got a taste of finals uh, 
before and I think she wants more of that for bouldering but now that speed is kind of like creep back up and I think hopefully that improvement that they're seeing in their speed times is uh is encouraging to them it's encouraging to me at least yeah and that, that makes me wonder you I, I'd be curious to hear from you what the speed climbing scene is like in in Canada because you know it's uh, the reason I ask is because it's interesting that that Alana holds the speed record because she is not a speed specialist. Mm -hmm. And whereas in the, like, for example, in the United States, um, the, the national records are held by John Brosler for the men and Piper Kelly for the women. And they are speed are both, climbers. And they, yeah, they're both, I mean, they're both good at kind of all disciplines and practicing the other disciplines with the combined format now, but undoubtedly, unquestionably, they are speed specialists. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just interesting to contrast that with, in, in Canada where the speed record holder is, is somebody who's not traditionally a speed specialist. Yeah. So it, the, the men's speed record, and I don't know the number and I, I can't be a hundred percent sure, but last season at the end of nationals, I'm pretty sure it was still a guy from out West called named Bob Patterson, uh, who's our speed record holder for men. And he is kind of like a speed specialist as much as you be a speed specialist in Canada. And I'm pretty sure it's in the sixes. If I remember right, I can't be sure. Those numbers just elude me right now. And you could not possibly find that information on the Canadian Federation site because mm. it just doesn't have that stuff. Uh, but for women, the the previous holder of the speed record uh, was just from this past May at Lead in Speed Nationals. It was a girl from Quebec uh, named Babette Hua, who's like not... I, you know, I'm not super familiar with how the Quebec scene trains, but I don't see her as a speed native. It was kind of a... Um, I don't want to call it a fluke because she was certainly training speed, but she's, in my opinion, a boulderer for the most part. Although I think she's evolving into an all-around climber might be her like focus now. Um, but yeah, the Canadian speed scene is like we have that big wall that was built in 2008 in Victoria or in, in Central Saanich out in the West Coast. And then uh, Quebec has one speed wall, which was built like just a year and a half ago for the Pan Ams. Um Quebec has one or two other like 10 ish meter walls uh, where at least it's like a dedicated speed wall, but it's still not legit. Ontario has no proper speed wall at all. And then Alberta, whether or not, I don't think it's um, like uh, an inspected homologated wall or whatever they call it. Like it hasn't been IFSC approved quite yet, um, but they have one in Calgary and Alberta. So so where I'm from in Ontario, is like a speed desert. Um, a gym mm. just put in like a nine meter wall and everybody's flocking there like crazy to train speed because it's the best possible thing. But um, aside from a couple like West Coasters who have had that Victoria speed wall for like 10 years now, there isn't really speed culture that much in mm. Canada. It's pretty slow, slow going. Well, and it's only been in the past couple years that I think, it, at least since I've kind of had my pulse on it, it seems like it's becoming a really popular thing in the States, a popular discipline specifically. And mm -hmm. I think about the kids that I coach, um, I think just because speed is naturally kind of exciting to the layman, um, they all the kids the almost always like one of the first disciplines that they're psyched about is speed sure, if, if yeah. they're not familiar with climbing um and and so speed climbing has really become quite popular in the past couple of years mm -hmm. and, and here in the states so yeah if you like if you don't have a speed wall in your gym you should at least be incorporating some like timer element into your birthday parties like i think I, I don't think a lot of owners realize how, like, business-wise, speed can be a huge draw for customers. Um, even yeah. just, like, the three friends that show up on your doorstep just, like, on a rainy day because they had nothing else to do. Like, anybody can have a good time just bashing their friends on, like, a, you know, on a seven-meter jug hall just seeing who goes fastest. It's a good time for everybody. So, buy, buy timers, y'all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Back to uh, let's let's talk about just I don't want to put too much into it because there isn't that much information to talk about. But it's the first uh, World Cup where we have mm -hmm. a female head root setter finally. Yes. So that's like really cool. I need to talk to them more about this, but it, it seems like there is kind of a renewed push in the IFSC to kind of refresh the setting pool, the the root setter pool. I see more names getting drawn into that and, and starting to, to get into that. It seems like they're paying attention to it now, which is awesome. Um yeah, so that's neat. <laughs> I don't know much else to say. Well, it was exciting uh, going into it because I was thinking that it, it last week at Meiringen, the big news in a lot of ways coming out of it had to do with the setting, with the hand jam, the crack sure. problem. That was one of the big exciting takeaways. And then going into this event, 
um, with the the first IFSC certified female root setter. Um, it, the root setting was, you know, a storyline as well, a positive storyline going mm-hmm. into this event. Um, now, at, as we look back at the event, I think that maybe that some of that positive, you know, uh, maybe that glean is that, that sheen is a little bit um, tarnished. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but going into the event, it was really exciting, and I like that the IFSC is is doing that, mm-hmm. uh, getting new people, new ideas on the setting squads. That actually, somebody had actually written to us. We actually had a question written in. Um, this might be a good time to address it if I can find it here. Let's do it. Um, so uh, this was sent to me on Instagram. What do you, sorry, what do you take your notes on? I want to show me your. Do you use like a legal sheet or like what do you use? Yeah, I, I know have your... a. So I have a, a yellow a notepad, and then but I also have I mean just like scraps of paper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so this was sent to me. We had, we had made a call out for if anybody had any questions that they wanted us to address related to the World Cup uh, competition, send them to me on Instagram or send them to you on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Um, so this was from a, a user on Instagram. There, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but it's <laughs> E-V-G-E-N-I-I-K-R-E-M. And so we appreciate uh, this oh, person. Oh, I know Predicate. that dude. Hold on a second. I'm pretty sure... <laughs> Uh, I think his name's Eugene. I think he's a root setter in Alberta, and I'm pretty sure he like worked at a gym with me. Anyway, well, yeah. tell what's what's the what's the question? Well, so he said, uh, when will the IFSC start profiling the setting team? And and I think, you know, I assume he he means like on the broadcast, actually making it a segment where yeah. they where they kind of go into detail with not just naming the setter, but like really doing some more in depth profile of of who's on the squad. Um, yeah. Uh, well, like, so let's go back a week and they did do that little segment with Jamie Cassidy last week. And I'm not sure if that was their intent to to have a brief conversation with the chief every single event. Um, or maybe they were just drawn into the storyline of the custom jam holds or whatever. Uh, they didn't do that this week, or at least not one that I saw. And I'm pretty sure I watched all of the broadcasts. They didn't sit down with, uh, with Katya. Um, but that said, there was also a lot of talk of how... Um, there was, I don't want to say chaos. After semifinals, the setters did a ton of work and like worked right up to the end of their uh, of their setting time. So even like Charlie Bosco didn't have time to get on the finals problems to talk about them. So maybe they wanted to and they just couldn't. But yeah, just I I think that's a that's an interesting question and I think it, um, I think people need to think about how they want root setters to be a part of the sport. Like if um. Within like the current format, I don't think root setters are a thing we acknowledge too much from the spectator experience. And I think there's a feeling that if you acknowledge the role of a root setter, of like a sentient human that can make choices that affect how the competition goes, I think there's a sense that that might devalue what the climbers do, right? Like it kind of like ruins the storyline of, you know, you can talk about like, oh, Yanya had an amazing day and this person didn't perform so well. But then if I come to you and say, well, hey, the head root setter was Slovenian and two Slovenians won the event and maybe like that had something to do with it. Maybe their culture of climbing and setting on the same team, the C team in Slovenia and in whatever city that's in, you know, maybe that's the issue. Uh, Maybe that had something to do with it. It does take away from the climber storyline if you start to focus on the root setting profile too much i don't know if that's a bad thing but it's a unique problem to or it's a unique like question to have about a sport you don't really see that in in many other things like i said i think to you in a previous conversation like all the guys that designed the great golf courses are dead now you can't say that you know whatever crazy scotsman from 300 years ago he wasn't affecting the game that all of these current um golfers are uh, are playing he couldn't influence them but it's so contemporary the root setter versus the climber i'm not sure if um if like if typical sports fans what am i trying to say i think it could be cool but i feel like we're afraid that it might take away from the climbers i guess that's that's what uh, i feel like the current wisdom is yeah, and we it, you we should mention the the lady's name. It was Katja Vidmar, right? Yeah. The the first. I don't know if we've we've said her name yet. The first uh, IFSC female route setter. Um, 
certified route setter. So she deserves to be recognized in in name. Yeah, and just uh, to say, like she's from a she's from a strong climbing family. Her younger sister mm-hmm. Maya Vidmar was a was a huge lead climber for a long time, up to up to kind of like 2014, I guess. And Katya herself was like a mainstay on the Bouldering World Cup circuit through like the what do we call it now the aughts or whatever mm-hmm. but she started youth climbing around the the turn of the millennium and i don't think she ever no she didn't ever win a boulder world cup uh but she did come second if i remember and it was in moscow i think it was in 2008 so again like just uh i think her father was a climber she was very tight with that slovenian team and she's definitely like a predecessor to the yanias that you see um the luchka uh, uh red, red Anyway, the Rak- other Slovenian, yeah, the, yeah, the other Slovenian climbers of today, they're all really connected. She's a, it's, it's very cool that it is a former climber um, mm-hmm. with such like a steep IFSC history. That's kind of nice. Yeah. And she's just, we were just talking last week about some of these big names from just a few years ago that aren't really part of the conversation for the Olympics yet. They were the ones that kind of carried the, the figurative torch for a long time for, for yeah. competition climbing. They, yeah, they built the foundation, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Maya and Katya are certainly in that group. Um, to your point, though, I think that's, yeah, I mean, it's tricky for you and I to to step out and look at this objectively because you have set and I have set, and, and so we both appreciate and like it when the root setters are uh, given a lot of recognition and given a lot of attention. I don't know if if I was just kind of Joe Schmo tuning into a competition, um, you know. I don't know if how much time I would want to see devoted to like the route setters. Um, I just don't know. I, I just don't know because I am very interested in that stuff. I don't mm-hmm. know if somebody who's not. Uh, as invested in climbing would be as interested in kind of the nuance. Well, think of the guy that like comes into your gym and he sees a guy root setting and suddenly in his mind, he connects the idea that there is a person whose job it is to just like make rock climbs, right? When they Mm -hmm. find out that it's not like off a map or they didn't like download the instructions or whatever, that clicks in their head is like, damn, that's a really cool job, right? So I think when people understand that, they're very into it. And honestly, I think that like, and I don't want to like derail the the entire conversation because I do want to talk about the World Cup, but I think right now we we treat bouldering and lead as sports or like as athletics. Let me call it that. Like we treat it like athletics, which is a kind of um. I, I'm going into territory that I haven't thought about enough in my head to sure. like properly describe it, but it's very athlete centered. Um, mm-hmm. It is accomplishing a task as well as you can. Right. But because it has this element of this other human being and this other like human factor creating the challenge and a challenge that you can't plan for something that you've never seen before. It has, in my opinion, more of like bouldering and lead relate to me more as a game rather than athletics. Like it's more of a game-based sport where there is a somewhat arbitrary set of rules. And again, like the format we do in bouldering is entirely arbitrary, right? Like that's just just how we decided to value boulders. Um, Lead, it's a bit more obvious. But speed climbing is not arbitrary at all. You have a route, you get to the top fastest. Like to me, that is an athletic sport that is Mm -hmm. athletics it fits right in with track and field it's very easy to understand and there's no outside element with bouldering there is and so i in in relation to this question from i think it's eugene what's up eugene um i think if we maybe take more of an angle of looking at bouldering as more of a game-based sport we can honestly acknowledge that there is this unique and somewhat random element of root setters. And I think it would be a really cool thing to embrace because I think it's a very cool role. It has a completely unique dynamic that's not present in any other sports. Um, So yeah, I hope we do more of it, but I think that right now, especially from the IFSC and from the Olympic movement, it's not really kosher to acknowledge, you know, other factors aside from the athletes themselves. Yeah. And there are two things that kind of, come to mind here. First of all, I, I don't know how many people viewing this are in Canada and maybe we're unable to watch the ESPN uh, American USA Climbing Nationals, <laughs> but the, the those live streams or those broadcasts did actually have a segment where they went uh, you know, backstage with the it was a pre pre-filmed segment with the route setter yep. where they were not only talking about the the problems, the specific 
you know, boulders in finals, but they actually had another person in the background, uh, like forerunning it. Yeah. And, totally. and, and so, and it was great. I mean, it's just interesting. It, it, it adds an element to the broadcast. Uh, so I think that's something that those USA climbing broadcasts did, uh, better than the, the IFSC broadcasts. Um, yeah. I, I, and I like, remember there were IFSC broadcasts where they have had the root setters in the booth, if I remember correctly. And that was a mainstay of like ABS broadcasts was dragging the, the root setter in for a little bit for a couple minutes. Um, I think it's a great thing. Like, I love it. I don't know if the IFSC, um, I don't know if it fits with their vision. I think, well, maybe it does, but I think right now we're trying to focus on the athlete. I think that's kind of the lens that we're, um, looking through right now is as an athlete centered thing. I'm not sure if it really fits with the, with the Olympic model of, of what a sport is. It's like, I don't know. Do you, you get like Olympic hockey, are you going to do a profile on the refs? Like, right. I, Cause I think that's a great, um, I think that's a great element of sports is that you can have, and again, I don't know what sports these are, but when you have those refs or those umpires that have to make calls and that becomes a huge discussion point and it's like the loudest moment in the stadium when somebody makes a rules call, why not embrace that kind of thing with root setting or more specifically with appeals? Like you talk about last uh, last week in Maringen where there was that appeal after the, um, after the presentation or at least after we had seen the scores. Why not broadcast like whatever poor fuck it was that was the like the the technical delegate or the jury president why not broadcast them having to make the call um and and like approve or or uh, deny the appeal from the french team like that would be really cool it could yeah. be super exciting it would make people go nuts um it's too bad that the ifse doesn't allow chat in their in their video streams anymore because it would light up um i don't know that that's yeah. i think that would be a lot of fun and this also kind of goes into another topic that I was thinking about before we started recording, which was the fact that the IFSC broadcasts, they're on YouTube. You can go back and watch the live streams from like 2013, you know, whatever, 2014, 2015. Yeah. Like they're so similar to how they are now. Um, they've yeah. just been so slow to change any aspect of the production. Um and I just I wonder if I wonder if that is a good thing that consistency from year to year is a good thing or if it is if it's viewed as a as kind of a negative this refusal to change um, and and refusal to kind of add these these additional production flourishes from year to year uh, because yeah. you, if you watch if you watch a, a broadcast now. Like if you let's say if another sport, whether it's basketball or or baseball, if you watch a, a broadcast now, uh, you can tell it's it's contemporary and modern compared to watching a broadcast from ten years ago. Oh, it sure. just it just feels a little different. The graphics yeah. are are way different. Um, yet if I I don't know if you would do that. I don't know if it would seem that different if you watched a ten year old uh, IFSC broadcast and compared it to one now. I think it would probably be very comparable. Yeah, that's that's probably fair. And I think like the two things that I would say about that is one is it's definitely budget driven. Like I don't really know how the IFSC is using like I haven't seen an IFSC budget. Maybe I should look for one. Um, but whatever money they're bringing in, they have a lot of like financial concerns that they have to deal with. And I would personally rate broadcasting quality to be a very high priority because that is your product. But like, I mean, just until recently, they they have a really hard time finding host venues for really big events for like a world championship. They're having trouble finding somebody to do that. So there is there are a lot of financial strains that sorry, I'm rocking this camera by shaking the table. Um, so I think it's probably budget related that they're probably just getting away with paying as little as they can to whatever contractor they're using. But I would also say there have been a lot of improvements, I think, behind the scenes. And it might, I don't know if it's necessarily super obvious. First of all, I don't give a shit about light shows. And that's also not the IFSC. That is whatever the host venue is, almost yeah. certainly. Um, that Personally, I think that's a waste of money. You can use that on something else. Um, use it on having a native language broadcast, like get to, if, if Russia doesn't have broadcast rights, get two extra commentators in to do a Russian stream. Um, mm -hmm. but in terms of having like 
professional camera guys for the most part i think they're using actual hired cameramen now whereas five years ago it was literally a local volunteer like who can hold i had there was a, a girl that climbed out of our climbing gym she was probably like 13 at the time and she was like managing cables she was like mm. on the mats of a world cup final like coiling cables behind this volunteer <laughs> cameraman right five at, at toronto 2015 the production guy he was the commentator and the director and the producer so he's switching cameras he's like trying to corral all the volunteer camera guys and he's in the penalty box of this hockey arena trying yeah. to commentate with Sean McCall right so I think there have been improvements I'm sure they are spending more money on it um, but yeah I think the next steps of like having really good replays um, having a producer or an actual director I'm sure they have that to some extent now but um, I think I think it's hard just being in facilities where you don't get to control what the what your stage is, where your production office is. Like, I think that's mm -hmm. pretty tough. Um, but I wanted to get yeah. back to the world cup really quick. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to like, just go to the actual like uh, finals round and talk about that. Cause we were talking about Katya and the root setting. And I think that's probably one of the, I got four comments from people. I posted a thing. Um, so for anybody not that didn't know the women climbed first uh, this time in finals, I guess they alternate. I, Anyway, that was like, I guess I just never noticed that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I ever noticed that either. Yeah, <laughs> but that was good because last week I felt like I didn't give the women enough attention because I had already watched a long freaking men's round in finals and I felt like I was starting to zone out for the women. This time around, it was kind of the opposite. Um, but yeah, for the women's round, problem number one, really freaking cool. I don't know what it is. So far, all of the first problems from the two World Cups so far have been really good. Uh, but then women's number two was flashed by all six climbers. That is a dead boulder problem provided like no separation suddenly it's a three problem final um mm -hmm. so that kind of sucked because the the moves looked cool um but the understanding i have and this comes from first of all charlie saying that the setters were setting right up till like showtime for finals um and then yanya suggested it and a friend of mine caleb thomas suggested it that because semifinals was so like nails hard for the women it spooked the root setters and then they probably went to tweak so much and dial it down thinking that they were going to end up with like a topless final. Yeah. They maybe tweaked it too far, um, which is too bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was like <clears throat> there were the two polar, the polar opposites, right? The semifinal, I mean, just focusing on the women specifically, the semifinal was um, there just weren't many tops other than Yanya. It was just like, you mm -hmm. know, there were seven, so there were 20 competitors in women's semifinals, right? They all climbed four problems, so that's 80 yeah. climber problems. There yeah. were seven freaking cameras, seven yeah. tops, right? Seven right. tops out of 80 potential tops in semifinals. Yeah, that's, that's rough, a, that, I hadn't heard that statistic, but that that's good. That really illustrates how hard it was in the semifinals. Mm -hmm. And then in the finals, it was, it was kind the of the opposite. <laughs> it, and, and it was not just... It's like extra. It was extra bad because it wasn't just tops. It was like it was flashes. There yeah. were, I mean, it, you know, especially women's two, which you mentioned. It wasn't just six tops. It was six flashes, and it wasn't just that boulder. The other boulders were there were just a lot of tops, a lot of flashes as well. Um, and I think, especially when we get into the segment where we're going to talk about our grades for the event, that is where where I really took away some some points that's that's really where i kind of started to get uh just not as psyched about the competition as i was for example as the one last week um just because yeah. it was it was just flash after flash after flash well let's talk about the flashes just i did this math really quick so yep. there's six climbers and i i cannot count on a screen especially when cameras are backwards anyway six climbers and finals you climb four problems each that's 24 problems 14 of those were flashed that's a lot, that's a lot. man. That's a lot. I mean, it, this actually, I was thinking about this, and I don't know if we could, if this is even possible, but let's say you have a boulder um, and you have six competitors. What would be your ideal sequence in terms of like who gets, does anybody get the top? Does anybody get the flash? Like what, and what order? Like what would be a good spread? I uh, Well, I think like for me, I would like, I, it's really hard to think on a per problem basis. So I guess this is going to be kind of a rough average is I would really like only one person to flash it. I would like two or three more people to top it in a certain number of attempts. 
and then I'd like the last two people to get the zone. I don't know. I like ideally everybody achieves some form of success. I don't want somebody to get zeroed out completely because that is four minutes of just watching somebody fail. Um, mm -hmm. And that like genuinely sucks and makes me pull out my phone and, you know, watch cat videos or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of what I would hope for is I, I would rather the comps come down to attempts like problem number one for the women i really like that one there were flashes on it but you got to see them get stumped by ultimately one crux they had to make decisions they had to like address how they were approaching what seemed like a fairly obvious situation right there was one giant foot ledge you have a left hand and a right hand figure it out it was all positive and you just reach up to a hold and it was actually really complex i love that stuff so breaking it down by attempts that's my my personal preference yeah, I think ideally what you want is when you have six competitors on a boulder, you want there to be kind of narrative. You want there to be narratives, right? You want there to be an up and an emotional up and down. Yes. And so I was thinking in an ideal situation, as much as you can think think about this, which I admit it's kind of a flawed system. But yeah, maybe have the first two competitors get some points, but not get the top. Um, and, you know, the, let's say the third competitor gets a top. So, you know, it's toppable, mm -hmm. right? Um, which puts pressure in terms of storyline, right? It puts pressure on the remaining climbers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then maybe the the fourth and fifth climber don't get a top, um, and and then maybe the the last climber flashes it. I mean, yeah. that's what you know. You want to get you flashes are exciting and tops are exciting, but you don't want to have more than one or two competitors getting a top or a flash. Um, yeah, I I don't like so. Like, I think the the overall thing of what I want from a finals is I want everybody to be in the game, like pretty much everybody, maybe one person's out, but I want five or six people to be in the game through the first two problems through the third problem. I want that to be like the one that narrows it down to like the top four guys. And then on problem number four, ideal world, it's the last guy that comes out, flashes it for a win. Like those are really just the three things I want. Otherwise I want it to be back and forth, right? Like I don't want the sixth place person to be just locked in the coffin, like through the entire thing. I want them like a, a week ago in Maringen, Tomoaki Takata comes out, flashes number one. And just like instantly is like, hello, I'm in this. And he, you know, fell apart later on. But that's really cool. That like shakes up the space. And especially in these really stacked fields, that's how it should be, right? Like sixth place qualifier is not that far away from the first place qualifier for the most part, aside from freaks like Adam and Yanya. Um, but yeah, I think it should be, I think it should stay very active, extremely fluid. I don't want it to be just like a demonstration of your physical prowess. I want it to be, cutthroat and I want it to be like high pressure situations. I want to see people have to make decisions about whether or not to get back on or not um, in limited time. I want it to be like tough on them. I want it to be fun. Yeah. And, and women's too, to go back to that one, it's, I mean, that's just a, it's going to, you're probably going to have boulders like that. Every sure. Season, oh yeah. You know, but it's just a, a kind of gross miscalculation of the ability of the competitors, whether it was pre-planned or whether it was kind of last minute panic or whatever you want to call yeah, it. And again, um, like you and I, we're not, we're not calling people out and being like bad no, root setters for this no. at all. There will be more of these. There have been many of them in the past, right? Like, guess yeah. what? This happens, but it's, a fun thing to pay attention to when it does happen. And it's cause for great discussion, right? Especially around root setting, which is fallible people trying to make decisions about climbers that, you know, they can't get like a perfect physical read on. It's really cool. Just a good storyline. And then the other storyline, which I don't want to talk about too much because I, I am genuinely not enough of an analyst to talk about this, but I had four people message me separately saying that uh, women's three and women's four in the finals were basically the same problem. Um, mm. And you could see a lot of similarities. Like for the most part, you start up with a rightward kind of like barn door dyno. And then yep. at the top, you're doing a right hand press, uh, left foot reach up to a finish. Um, Nikki from beta root setting, he does his like root setting recaps. I'm sure it'll be out like today or tomorrow. Uh, keep an eye out for that if you're watching because he does a really good job with like getting into the nitty gritty of how the moves are supposed to be done. I'm curious to hear what his opinion is going to be on that. Um, I, I went back and just the scores were different enough between women's three and women's four that I'm kind of like, well, yeah, maybe the moves were the same, but people were still getting screwed by one and not by the other and vice versa where I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But they were similar enough. I can understand people's gripes that it didn't really bring a new set of moves to the table, really, except for Fanny on women's four who decided to like skip a bunch of holds and just Superman all the way to the other side of the wall.
Yeah, and that's and that's a storyline. <clears throat> excuse me, in and of itself, is her like Fanny? She's, I mean, she's had a really good start to the season so far. Yeah. Um, but go back to the route setting. Yeah, that was kind of one of the one of the. I don't know. I don't know if it's a complaint, but just like one of my reactions to this whole to the the whole weekend was that I felt like the route setting was seemed a lot more homogenous when I tried to reflect on it compared to last last week at Mayringen. Um, they're just a lot of the problems kind of blended together in my memory sure. in ways that they did not the week before. Um, so but but I think to your point, that's not an indictment on any specific root setter. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you and I both know root setting is really hard and especially root setting for world class competitors i mean it's just it's a job that nobody could do perfectly mm -hmm. um and i mean let me ask you this would you maybe we've already kind of gone over it in our in our discussion in the past couple minutes but so would you prefer if you had to have one or the other would you prefer um having most competitors not getting to the top or having you know which way would you prefer like it was in the semifinals or like it was in the finals if you had to have one or the other mm. <laughs> because um, this is something I, i'll say this this is something that charlie bosco brought up on commentary and i i think it was during the semifinals when there were not a lot of women getting tops yeah he said you know you have to kind of wonder do you set for the sake of kind of stiffening up the the competition or do you set for the sake of kind of entertainment with getting like a lot of tops um yeah, okay, well, like, caveat to this is if you just took the top six women from semifinals, if you look at their scores from semis, that would be, like, a, a hard but decent final round, right? True, like, true. Like, Yan Yanya had, what, two tops? I, uh, yeah, let's absolutely see. Absolutely blanking. Um, but let's anyway, she, that would have been a, a good round, right? Like, it only still would have been, I think, seven tops in total, so not very many, but it would have been active. You would have had to see people, like, drill through those really hard problems. I think I would have preferred the top six from semis than the top six from uh, from finals. <laughs> Although, in general, I think I enjoyed the – not the results, but the problems themselves I thought were easier to watch and more intriguing in finals than they were in semifinals. But again, that's through the lens yeah. of having to watch it online where you can't see every attempt on every problem. Yeah, no, and if you're, I mean, and put yourself in the shoes of somebody who hasn't ever watched a comp before. If there are no tops, like how long is that going to go on before you turn off the live stream? Sure, yeah, man, you know? definitely. So, well, it uh, also juices you up because if people are getting the last hold, throwing to that last hold, which you saw in some of the semifinals climbs, that gets you psyched. That is showing yeah. that it's possible and who's going to break it. And you hope somebody does manage to. But I think I would have preferred it to be harder. Like maybe semis was too hard, but it did the job. It separated everybody. Um, yeah, I, I think finals was, finals was just too easy. Whatever. That's mm -hmm. how it goes. I thought women's number one was great. And then after that, it was, uh, it, it, yeah, there wasn't much to keep me excited storyline wise. It was like, wow, everybody's topping. They're probably going to top some more. So these scores look pretty solid because of all yeah. the tops, but yep. yeah. Yeah, uh, but again, like the climbing was amazing. Yanya walking away with four flashes. The cool thing about her is she has locked in like the best possible bouldering results she can have for her combined world ranking uh, calculations. So she doesn't even have to show up to the next five Boulder World Cups. She's still right now on the path to have like perfect bouldering scores to get her to, uh, to the Toulouse qualifying event if she doesn't lock it down with what I assume will be like a first place at the world championships. Um, yeah. so she's looking amazing. Um, great climbing from her. And again, the field of her Shauna and Fanny, that's looking to be a really exciting race. Too bad. Akio wasn't here. Um, but those three of them, like that's, uh, that's looking really consistent. This is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be an exciting like next part of the season mm -hmm. because, um, I think, you know, one of the things I wrote about with Yanya was last last year, it kind of seemed to be a slow build to her kind of sort of getting her mojo during the bouldering season. <clears throat> she didn't she did not win Mayringen, for example. Um, this season, it's almost like from the uh, from the from the start, she's mm -hmm. just clearly the kind of the front runner, the person to beat this season. Um, but Shauna is looking better and better. And um, it's. 
I mean, we said it last week. We don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's kind of easy to forget how good Shauna was because she was injured for the, you know, the second half of last season. Mm -hmm. She was not in a lot of the the World Cups, but and it's also easy to let, like let's not forget that Miho has been Miho Nonaki <laughs> has been sitting out the first couple. Yeah, for real. Um, so so once we have kind of all once. Sean is getting better. Yanya is is starting off as perfect as you could hope, and and Miho uh, presumably and hopefully she's going to enter some of these competitions soon and be healthy. Um, so it's it's going to be a, like a, a really exciting kind of shootout. Yeah, and, and those. I should just mention there are seven Boulder World Cup. Like there's seven World Cups of each discipline, right? For your overall combined ranking, you take your results from your best two. So if Yanya hypothetically doesn't go to the rest of the bouldering World Cups, that opens up somebody else's opportunity to take first place. So you could have multiple climbers, a maximum of, you could have three climbers that have each scored first place at two bouldering World Cups. And you now have three women that are going into the calculations with like a perfect score in bouldering. Um, we'll see what happens. Like if the field stays this consistent where you see the same three or four names every finals, which is definitely possible, although kind of surprising because again, like Shauna is freaking injured, man. Um, I, some of those problems, the uh, the rock over on women's number one in finals where you have to crank over that knee. And I, I assumed that was her injured knee. It might not be. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there's some moments where you're kind of like surprised that she's still in it. Um, I, Yeah, but uh, we'll see what happens for the rest of the season. Yeah, Charlie uh, Bosco even noted, I think it was during semifinal. I think it was maybe women's one or something on in semifinals. But he noticed that she was, Shauna was doing a lot of like micro foot sort of micro foot beta mm -hmm. movement, switching the feet, switching the feet, switching the feet. Um, and and Charlie noted that it could be because kind of psychologically she's she's still sort of, you know, Maybe, just yeah. like a little reluctant, doesn't want to commit, doesn't want to risk getting injured again. And that's a real thing. I'm um, So so it'll we'll have to see kind of as she but certainly, you know, getting second place in these competitions, that's got to be great for her her confidence getting yeah. second place. And, and, and so presumably that's going to kind of help her get over that psychological hump. Um, but it, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have much else to add other than that. Just Yanya has a, has had a great start to the season and, and it's going to be really exciting once, once, <laughs> once Miho's back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully she does come back. Yeah. Let's talk about the men. Cause I, I want to get around to talking about our favorite problems of the, mm -hmm. of the event. But um, the men's on the other hand, it was like a great, set of results like if if we want to complain about the women's results we have to talk about how good the separation was for the men Yerne walking away Yerne first of all such an amazing winner like that's the kind of guy I like to see win events just so expressive um very cool anyway he walks away with like four and four Andra and Yoshiyuki going away with three tops uh Anze and Ray or Anze with two Ray and Vadim with like one each that was a really good separation I thought that was awesome it was, and you know, real, real briefly about about uh, Yerne, I I would be curious to hear from anybody that happens to watch this that is maybe in Slovenia or is familiar with the Slovenian scene because how he deep seems, are we in the Slovenian YouTube? If you're market. out there, Slovenian viewership, um, because I would, he seems like he's got s like so much charisma, mm -hmm. um, and he just seems kind of like the if you want a guy to to kind of transcend. <clears throat> and and kind of maybe be that mainstream uh, media sort of presence, that competitive climber who's also a mainstream uh, presence. It seems like uh, Yerne is just, I mean, he's the guy. He's right? a boy. He's, yeah, for sure. He's a boy. Yeah, he's yeah. so he's so emotional. He's charismatic. He's he's really likable um, and, and down to earth, but also like fiercely competitive. It's just like I'm wondering why, you know. Nike's Slovenian office or whatever <laughs> is not uh, or is not contacting him. Um, maybe they are. I don't know. Who knows, but man. Uh, they don't make climbing shoes yet. But yeah, one day. But he's so fun to watch, yeah. and and that sort of excitement really translates to no matter what level of experience or like what level of fandom you are. If you're a, a just a first time viewer, or if you're some people like us who watch all these things, um, it's just so clear to see his enthusiasm and. And so he's great. Yeah, uh, and I should I should actually say because the second you said Nike, that rang a bell because the the um, the team Slovenia jerseys have the stripes on the shoulder, right? They are like an Adidas sponsored team. Yeah. So maybe not him personally, although he maybe. But uh, but yeah, the team's got Adidas, so it's not Nike, but they've actually got a company with some like with a foothold into outdoors and climbing shoes. So yeah, yeah, and I mean let's let's pause here to just talk about the Slovenian team as a whole, which is I mean it's. <laughs> 
the storyline I feel like for the past year and a half or two years has been the Japanese team, mm -hmm. and rightly so because they have so much depth, as illustrated by the fact that you know there's even more names this time in the finals. Yeah. Um, like every time the familiar the the names we get used to are out, there's like some more Japanese competitors that are in. Uh, but the Slovenian team, I mean, Yerne and Yanya and, and Luchka now, um, and, and I mean, they have lead climbers as well. It's just, there's so much depth on that team, uh, almost rivals the, the Japanese team. There, there is room for, and I'm probably not going to do it cause I don't speak like any languages, uh, but there is definitely room for somebody to be like filming content around that. Like Adidas has to, needs to take them up on that or 360 holds like 360 is another one of their team sponsors. They're based in Slovenia. So if you if you go back into um, what's that book Beyond the Face, uh, the one that Heiko put out a couple years ago, and you read Maya Vidmar's story, it kind of talks about how there is this like very and again it's a small country, but you have this unique culture that you can get from a small country where all of your climbers can easily get to one place and build an incredibly tight knit family and training group and group of friends right and i think they are benefiting from that where they've got these excellent coaches and then you've got you know all the climbers that have come through through the past couple decades like katya and maya all these you know just great role models they have such an excellent set of tools and it looks like the the culture that they've built over there is worthy of of you know you know, somebody send Jimmy Chin over to Slovenia and get yeah. working on that next one because it looks like they got a great thing going. I'd be really curious to hear more from their coaches about how they focus on training and how they use the athletes together. Like you and I are from huge countries where it's really hard to get climbers together. Um, there is the opposite and they're definitely making the most of it. It's really admirable. Very cool. Yeah. And there's, and that's an, they're another team that it's it's going to get, it's going to be really hard to predict who is, I mean, obviously you can say like Yanya, she's, she's the most likely candidate, but it's, it's hard to predict who, who are going to be the, the few Olympic, uh, births from that country. If, Maybe, uh, you know, yeah. um, it's not, I mean, it's kind, you can kind of predict it, but at the same time, it's not unlikely that somebody might go on a run and, and I don't know. Um, but back to your point about the finals, it was interesting in the men's final because it was interesting following Andra's progress and mm -hmm. noting how, in in a lot of ways, there were some, there were some similarities between this finals and and last week's finals at Meiringen, where Andra, you know, it kind of comes down to him and he has to perform. Yeah. Uh, and whereas last week, it was all praise because he just cruised through the hand jam that nobody else could do <laughs> yeah um he he kind of had some uncharacteristic uh little slip-ups on the final boulder of this in the, of this of uh moscow at moscow yeah it was it's having that it come down to the very fourth problem is exactly like it was before and yeah. unfortunately you had the order flipped whereas in Meringen we got to watch five guys flail and then the sixth guy come out and destroy it and have the show end on that high note we had the opposite which is really unfortunate but it's just how it goes where you're in a flashes yeah you're in a flashes yeah. this problem and then everybody else spends the rest of the time just like trying to get zone so it, yeah. you know it's so close yet so far there's nothing you can do about it um but yeah you're totally right it's very similar in a lot of ways to uh to last weekend just uh just a, a less entertaining order so well, well and andre you know he he started he had kind of that false start right yeah, like that he sort of it. like that miss that that kind of misfire um i haven't really have you watched it back closely to see no kind i of haven't rewatched finals but no I, i'm pretty sure it was just a foot slip like he he got his hands up and i just don't think the hold is or you know what i'm not even gonna say because i haven't rewatched yeah. it but he just flubbed it yeah, and then and then he once he kind of got established and had a couple goes, he he went. If I remember correctly, he went with the right hand yeah. um, where everybody else had gone for left hand, and mm -hmm. I I think he did that again on another attempt, and he then it was it on his, yes. he did on his on... last attempt. Yeah, that he that he kind of got the sequence right. Um, he, it's just very uncharacteristic that we we would see him. I mean, it's kind of unlucky that we would see like several mistakes in one yeah. like that in one boulder problem from from andra it's yeah. it's just fair yeah that's fair i it's it's 
you know, it's it's hard to say because there's so many dynamics, but it is unique anytime you can see one guy. Like we talked about it last week, having one person show how huge the gap is between them and other people on a particular set of moves with the hand jam, it was very pronounced. On this one, it was kind of more typical climbing, like it was kind of a large kind of compression situation, right? Um, very off balance. A lot of people using a toe hook or a heel hook to kind of keep themselves in this very wide stance. Um, and... You know, going up right hand, I think short term was a was a great move to secure that hold, but it wrecked you later on. And I'm honestly just surprised that he tried it again the second time. Like, I feel like after in that first attempt where he got his right hand up, I thought you could tell that he was like, oh, this this wasn't a great choice. But then he did it again. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Not much to say. He just didn't do it right. Yeah, he I was surprised at that, too, that he repeated the right hand because then that anybody that's watching it will see that that kind of sets you into a situation where you either have to kind of do a weird cross or you have to match on that tiny yeah hold. the cross would have been ridiculous if yeah like, i don't yeah, even know no. if that would have been possible so you'd have to do the match which granted if there's anybody that could do that match it <laughs> probably fair. is is andra yeah um and and to be fair to him he i i read on his instagram i think this morning that he seemed to be pleased with the result um you know he his his post was about how it was a good comp rather than how he was you know he wasn't like beating himself up sure over his over how he made a mistake there um but i imagine he's just happy he made it into like semifinals and finals after that shit qualifier round like he's probably just like walking on sunshine after you know and again not by that much again very close scores and qualifiers but like he was probably pretty nervous for a bit yeah, and that's why I kind of take away, going back to how the Americans performed, for example, just to tie it back to that, whenever I see, you know, if there are uh, multiple competitors in the top 30, um, then I think that's a good, I, I take that as a positive, because on any given day, anybody that's in, you know, in 21st or 24th or 25th, mm -hmm. you know, they could they could make it's not outlandish to think of them making finals. We've just seen yeah. it. We've seen it over and over where somebody is 20th or 25th one week. And then the next week they're, they're in the finals. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's these last couple of comps. You are seeing it come down to zones and attempts and attempts to zone like yeah. on that bubble. So yeah, it's, you're, you're just as strong as those guys. You just like kind of flubbed it and it happens and you can't beat yourself up because you climbed really well. You were just off by a hair's breadth. And and yeah, I, I don't think anybody should beat themselves up too much. It's something that I need to learn is to, because I generally just look at placing numbers. That's the easiest way for me to understand stuff. I like looking at the horse race. But when you do, you know, look at the actual results of, of each problem and how well people are doing, it's way harder to criticize people coming in like 30th place because you like have the same amount of tops and zones. It was just like you didn't flash a zone compared to the guy that did. So... Yeah, very true. And and Andre was the perfect example. I mean, he's, you know, of almost not making it into into finals or, or almost not making it into Semis. what was it? Into semifinals. Um, you know, that's Adam Andre. And then he almost wins the final, you know, he almost yep. wins it. So, um, yeah, and it, I I think that's a good point. Uh, a couple other takeaways from the men's final um you know, we talk about the depth of the Japanese team. They did it again <laughs> with they they proved it again with uh Ray Kawamata, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, just a, a not a, not a name that we're used to seeing in the finals. 15 years old, man. Yeah. Second World Cup, he debuted at Maringen. I think he was 21st, so he was right on the bubble again. Yeah. Um, but then comes out for finals. Like, that's really cool. That's just like last weekend we had Oceana. This week we had Ray. I love it. Love it, man. Yeah, Ray and um, um, Yoshiyuki Ogata, who who is a, a name that probably people are a little more familiar with yeah. if they've been following the scene. But but um, you know he's 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 maybe um, sometimes like below the the kind of top top tier Jap Japanese competitors yeah. like um, Kokoro Fuji and whatnot. Um, but he he looked great as well. I mean, there's just Japan is just an amazing assembly line of yeah. these competitors. It's it's just I mean, I don't want this to be something that we we kind of <laughs> now live stream, but yeah. it's it's just like how can you how can you not come away thinking that after yeah, watching this, this competition there was a uh, check out yoshiyuki's uh instagram story he the, somebody like clipped him falling off of uh number i can't remember what number it was but he took like a whiplash fall like hit the mats 
almost threw his neck out. It was like pretty rough fall, but he's a fun guy to watch. He needs a haircut, but he's a, <laughs> he's a fun guy to watch. It was cool to see him. So I'm not gonna I'm but, gonna I'm not gonna knock anybody <laughs> on their hair, the length of hair. So. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but it's just, it's just awesome to see. I mean, like, how can you not love the the Japanese team? It's, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. exciting. Um, okay, so let's let's do problems of the comp. Mm. But uh, let's I don't if you want you can do one for the women, one for the men. Or we can just do a single one. I think I've already mentioned it. Just like last week, I have to choose problem number one. Um, I enjoyed women's number one and men's number one out of finals a lot. I thought they were both just like really good storyline climbs. Had like, especially women's number one was gorgeous. So it was a beautiful climb with very simple lines. And the beta was in just how you approach body positioning. For the men, it was somewhat similar. Um, I think I would give it to men's number one though, because it's the climb that I think I want to try the most, just starting in a, like an upwards press, moving out through a bunch of like pinchy big volumes that you had the option of going feet first, uh, or going hands first, or doing a combination of both. You went into an inside corner and then you have to wrap like around in a ret. I thought yep. it had like everything for me. I really loved watching climbers on men's number one. I like men's number one. I wrote it down as kind of honorable mention. I also like men's number three. Not maybe not enough to make it my all time my my favorite of the weekend, but it did have this neat little move where you had to stand up into a like a double thumb catch. Yeah, uh, which I thought was really a, a unique kind of a unique sequence. Probably my favorite would be women's four. Um, really? Because it, well, <laughs> you know I'm as much so. Let's. T- <laughs> It was very parkour in sure, the sense yeah. that, you know, to, to remind people, you started in kind of an undercling, mm-hmm. and then it was like a, a sort of dynamic coordination to a left hand, and then you went to a right hand If you're hand wondering out. what women's number four was, just think of whatever women's number three was, and it was the same, it was the same thing as that, just with yeah, white holes. Yeah, well, and you're kind of, you're cutting feet, you're moving over these, um, these, across these white slopey spheres, um, yeah. it's, it was just exciting. I, it's like, I'm a sucker for for like parkour <laughs> moves you know it's which is funny because i feel like years ago when when this style of setting first kind of started to become in vogue everybody loved it and now it's almost like the cool thing is to say that you don't like the parkour totally, style yeah, obviously um, climbing right, is yeah. nothing but a bunch of hipsters that's yeah all we it's are. like it's like you, you used to like it back when but now now that it's commonplace it's now that it's signed with the big record label you don't like it anymore exactly. um but but I don't know. It's still exciting. Like whenever competitors are cutting feet and 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 doing you know like double double moves coordination, I I I just thought it was fun. Yeah, it's fun to watch. I, and I think like I was thinking about like moments of the comp as well. Um, Fanny on that climb was was pretty close to maybe the most impressive attempt that we saw. Like obviously uh, behind his flashes were dope, but the like just skipping holds and dynoing all the way out to basically a Gaston finish was really cool on that problem. Yeah, and that's another thing that I liked about it was just that there were different ways to do it. There's different beta, mm-hmm. um, and and Fanny, Fanny, it's it was interesting too because I don't think of Fanny as being obviously she's good at dynamic moves, but I don't think of her as being a particularly dynamic climber. More, I, I usually think of her as kind of like crimping really strong, um, really good on slab, and and I mean she she did awesome on that. So. Yeah, no, she killed it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about your favorite moment of the comp? I think probably Yerne topping the men's sure. four. He's, I mean, it, he just it was so he's so emotional. He wears it on his sleeve. Um, it was just great, and he's done it before. We know that that's kind of how he celebrates. He he kind of goes crazy. So when he's when he he gets close to that you know yeah <laughs> like okay you know come on you're in a yeah you get excited because you want to see that big celebration um i think him topping and then the kind of going crazy the wild celebration that was probably my my favorite moment i i hope that my favorite moment going forward of every competition is not just the the f- final move on the final <laughs> on the final problem because that would kind of no be that would be like, like that would be legitimately amazing but, if like every yeah. time you could say the best part of every comp is the last move that would be like that would be an a plus season that would be the that's best true. thing that's true uh, yeah um i was how about you so year was one except like it was 
again, it was tainted because it happened so early. And when it happened, I thought, oh, okay, this means Andre's going to win. If he made it look that easy climbing when Urine did it, a bunch of other people are going to top it. And then Andre's going to top it and the comp is over. Um, and I thought that would lead to Andre having the best moment right at the end when he would like flash it and win. Um, so that like kind of dampened it down. And then Fanny's thing was really cool as well. Um, it was kind of like the only like showstopper move where like everybody was like, whoa, that was really yeah. cool. But I think the the win for me, and I, I, I'm such a sucker for like high quality video production. Yeah. I like cut this thing, but the best part for sure was this incredible light show oh, that the Russians put up oh, with uh, the, <laughs> the very phallic <laughs> rocket ship oh, on the speed wall. Just, uh, and I forgot to clip the audio. I only got the video, but just you hear people laughing in the background. You can hear uh, Charlie Bosco like trying to keep the giggles to himself. Yeah. It's clearly like an instance of nobody played this video with the two spotlights on while they did the light show because it right. kinda, it changes the messaging a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I only see I'm a repeating this ship. thing over and know. over. I'm not stopping this at all. This is just too good. So, but you know, this... Uh... <laughs> This, uh, this brings up another question, um, because there, that was not the only, uh, that was certainly the only video that was like that, the, the, but there there was also, there was a lot of, I don't know what you'd call it, pomp and circumstance to the opening of this show, right? There was also a, I, like there was somebody dressed as a, a squirrel or a chipmunk, did you yeah, see this? Climbing the speed wall, yeah. Climbing the speed wall, <laughs> um, are you... Yeah. I wanted to ask you, are you a fan of these, like, I don't know what you'd call them, opening ceremonies that, that just kind of go big and <laughs> ostentatious? I Yeah. Because okay, it, well, yeah, like, for context, like, I'm the kind of person, I go back and I watch the opening ceremonies from London 2012. I rewatch that entire show probably, like, two or three times a year because that was fucking nuts. That was sick <laughs> as hell. Okay, so yeah, the right. anyway, we're not going to get into that, but that was amazing. And I don't mind giving like a country a platform to do like a, li a little show of your cultural whatever. And then you have all the uh, climbers come out with their flags like that's all cool. Um, I think it is. Sometimes it's funny. That's all I'm going to say is that yeah. sometimes it is funny from my perspective, whether it's a rocket ship penis blasting up the wall or if it's just like you know just you know some part of a culture that i don't have any background with sometimes i just like giggle at it because i don't get it and it's hilarious um it's fine i think sometimes it is overwrought um and i think the hard part for spectators like us at home is that these aren't the kind of shows where there is one show director and under him is the floor director and then the um like the video director right these are all incorrect terms i'm not talking about this correctly yeah. but these are the kind of shows where somebody is running the show on the stage and somebody separately is running the show for the broadcast and they are not connected so you're never going to have great audio you're never going to have good video cuts you're not going to have everything choreographed to make it look good for us at home it might be amazing on the stage but for us at home we're going to get a lot of crowd noise was just like people giggling in the stands. We're not going to get the close up of the guy speaking. The audio from the MC is never going to be good. Like until we get to that stage, it's going to be extremely hard for traditional, you know, Cossack dancing or whatever for that to translate impressively to people watching on like an IFSC live stream. Yeah. And I think, you know, whenever I watch this, these opening ceremonies, I always kind of have to think that there's probably some lost in translation cultural stuff here, you know, um, yeah, because I know that, you know, different countries are going to celebrate in different ways and, and spectacle is going to be a little nuanced from country to country. Um, it's not my it's not my favorite thing. I understand it for the Olympics because it's every four years, and even then, it's obviously not in the same country every four years. So it is mm -hmm. a big deal when it's in your country. Um, for these World Cup events that are in the same city every you know every year, uh, it seems a little over the top for me to 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 do these really elaborate ceremonies, but. Um, I'm not going to knock anybody if they like them, you know, it's, it's yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm a hundred percent fine with them, especially because so many of these organizers, like they're not getting a ton of gain from hosting a world cup. They're not money makers. Well, I shouldn't say, okay, I'm just going to make like terrible jokes. So I'm going to 
cough that all down. They're not money makers, right? That's just how it is. You're basically volunteering to host an event. So do your thing. That's fine. But I think we're just not at a place where the production value will be good enough in the next five years for it to be like, yeah, that was awesome. Like you're not going to get anything, obviously nothing close to the Olympics, but even, you know, look at whatever other sporting event, go to a basketball stadium and like, you know, you get flames coming out beside the door and there's like projections onto the floor. There's something that's just tighter and it's professionally done and they've had decades of experience and putting on a show right now. This kind of World Cup stuff is you grab a local like children's dance school. They come out, they put on like cultural clothes. They do a thing. They do the Swiss horn thing. You have mm-hmm. your rocket phallus blow up on the screen. Like that's that's as good as it gets for now. It's just, you know, so what we got to accept. Yeah. And I my big pet peeve, I of all this, of all the, the stuff that we've talked about, my biggest pet peeve is I, I do not like the spotlight on the competitors when they're climbing. I think that, and, and even, so it's especially bad for speed climbing yeah. because they noted this, uh, that sometimes the, the spotlight doesn't follow the, the climbers exactly. And when you're doing a seven second, six second race, uh, that can make a big difference. That can throw off your, your timing. That I can imagine, throw off yeah. your concentration. Um, and, but, but even aside from speed for bouldering, I just, I don't like the spotlight. I like to be able to see hmm. the, the larger wall, um, I, it's, you know, you, you look at other sports, they don't usually that I can think of, they don't like spotlight the competitors, right? Like, like in, like in basketball, right? It's not a spotlight on the guy who has the ball. It's <laughs> just, you, you get imagine? to see the full court. Just like the, you know, just f- opening in the clouds and just, no, that would be cr- right. crazy. Um, no, I don't think there's, I don't know if I'd consider those parallel though, because yeah. it is like, it's a different playing field. I'm trying to think of if there's any similar sport that I can think of. Not not to my knowledge. I don't know. I'm, I'm So genuinely, I'm fine with the spotlights in bouldering. Um, I'm even okay with it in lead. Um, but I, I think the one thing I would have trouble with is, uh, for lead especially, is that if you only have the spotlights on the climber and then the wall is dark when there's like in between time, it doesn't give you a chance to like put the camera on the wall and talk about, you know, other parts of the climb. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm fine with spotlights. I'm interesting to hear that you're anti-spotlight. And that's... Well, I think it it has to do with uh, when you can see the whole wall and and then in other cuts when you can kind of see the 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 audience in the background, mm-hmm. you know, at certain angles it makes it seem like a really big event whereas if it's just spotlighted on the competitor, um it just feels like it's this really small uh boxed in. I oh. it just doesn't make it seem like a grand as grand of a spectacle to me. Um That's interesting. I've never felt that, but that's that's yeah. valid. I don't know. And and I've seen, I'm sure you've seen as well, some spotlights that are done very poorly in competition oh, yeah. too, where it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's like the spotlight <laughs> is only on the competitor. You can't see the hold that they're going for because yes. it's out of the, it's out of the light. Yeah. Um, so I think there is some gray, a gray area. There's a, a kind of a good way to do it. And there's a, a bad way to do a spotlight on for climbing. Um, but I don't know. I just prefer that <laughs> just give it, you know, well lit. Let me see the, the whole wall. Let me see the audience, all that. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. we should have got some more like fl- apparently the audience was really big and that's one of those spots where you wish you had a camera on the crowd to like to make the sport look better if you see a hall like full of people cuz they put up bleachers, sure. right? Like a huge rack of bleachers. Um yeah. and it looked impressive, so I wish we got to see more of that cuz it would kind of validate the sport a bit more for people watching at home. And um, it would make it, it would be unique compared to you know, a spotlight on the competitor for a, a World Cup, spotlight on a competitor for your local comp- gym competition. You know, they look the same, right? But mm-hmm. if you have a, if you're able to get the audience in the frame, the massive audience at a World Cup competition, it makes it seem bigger and 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 a little different, a little special. But, or you could just have an array of rocket ships right? fucking <laughs> flying out of the boulder wall every time you top something. Yeah, we <laughs> can do that too. That I, would be I, I'm impressive. curious what it what it was like live i wonder because you know we have to be fair here uh, things well, on like you said on camera they a lot of times they seem uh they're interpreted <laughs> you know that looks pretty cut and dry i, I admit but yeah um, well no it was it was so you can hear if you rewatch the replay you can hear the crowd laughing and yeah. then if uh i i foolishly didn't save any of the instagram stories but like four or five athletes had video of that on their Instagram story, just like with big question marks and like the like thinking emoji or whatever. Like it was pretty clear in the hall that like most people kind of took it that way. 
Again, yeah. I feel so bad for whoever the lighting guy was that realized that as he's like, he has to shine these spotlights, but he realizes he's creating this this meme. Fortunately, yeah. climbers don't know how to make memes, so there's like, this is going to die and nobody will laugh about it ever again. So I, I We'll see. I, wah, wah. If, what's what's the big meme Instagram? Rock talk or something? Is that the yeah, big Instagram? Yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we'll see if it appears. I mean, it, it, it might not because there actually wasn't any like climbing in that instance, exactly, right? Yeah. Like it could have been a light show from any sporting event. Yeah, they probably uh, don't watch World Cups. Let's be serious. If they like, have, I don't understand half their memes because it's about like outdoor climbers and I don't pay any attention to that uh, that set of the world. But um, one other thing about goofy stuff and it, it kind of bothered me, but also made me laugh was that they used custom sounds for the timer. So when you had one minute left, you got like this pub, like if you're in a, in like a subway system and the public announcement thing goes off, you hear like a da, 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 da. And that was the sound for one minute left. And then when time ran out, you got like a big slide whistle, like, Boom. Yeah, it was, it was like a like a, an Atari mm. video game or something. Yeah, and it, 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 there were one or two times where you had the climber fall off and get that sound all at once, and that made me laugh. But otherwise, I was kind of confused that that's not a regulated part of uh, of the rule book. Like I thought for sure the rules would kind of say that you would just have to use the official IFSC sounds, just the standard beeps. But what do I know, man? Yeah, I, I, that would be a, an interesting different episode we could talk about like rules that are not rules that they might want to consider making rules sure. or, or kind of standards and practices because uh yeah you would think that that would be standardized from competition to competition but if it keeps being hilarious then i welcome every country to do what they want and just get super super goofy with it it yeah. would be great man we'll make it like the having the um, having the soundtrack being done by some like local ethnic band for every event let's, we can let's let's get homer simpson saying Oh, yeah, like exactly. that should be the end. That yeah, should yeah, be yeah. The, the buzzer. Yeah, heard yeah. some right. Donald Trump soundboard will be will be the new one. But yeah, yeah. We, anyway. We to town. So awesome. overall, let's wrap it up. Your, yeah. I want to know your grade for the event. I think you went first last time, so I'll go first this time. Um, it didn't end on the storybook finish. There was too much conversation about setting not being perfect for the women's round, which took some luster off it. Um, and the results were, aside from the cruder thing, were kind of expected. Like the women's field, there wasn't as much going on as there, you know, there wasn't as much potential for like an upset as there was uh, as there was last week, just because there were so many flashes. Um, so I think I got to give this like a B. I don't know. Last week was an A minus. This week's a B, I think. So I gave also it. Also the like, time zone. Yeah. Sorry, that's legit. Yeah. Host host all events at a time when I can watch them without waking up early. Well, you know, I was thinking about that because it was brutal waking up at 4 a.m. to watch it, the semifinals live. You and I are on the – we're far away, but we happen to be on the same time zone. So waking up at 4 a.m. to watch it live, uh, then watching the finals at – I think it was 11. Uh, it was just a lot to do in one day. But when I'm thinking about these grades, I'm thinking about – Maybe not so much our specific viewing experience, but also a grade that you could apply as if you rewatch it, you know, year after year, right? Um, okay. And somebody that just brings it up on YouTube, in you know, at any point now, they're not going to have to deal with that crazy time sure. time zone schedule that we did. But, but yeah, it's not my preference when we have to watch the semis and the mm. finals, you know, early in the morning, all on the same day. Uh, that's just a lot of staring at a laptop screen for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, so my my grade, I gave it a C plus. Um, <laughs> well, and oh, shit. so here's let me get into this because I wrote down. So as much as we joke about the the opening ceremony thing, I think the production was pretty good. The stream quality was good. Yes. Um, and and Char I, I like Charlie Bosco a lot. I think he did a great job. He had uh, also speaking of commentators, just shout out to um, Josh Levin for doing a really yes. excellent job for the speed broadcast. I love listening to him. Yeah, and let's see, just to, so I wrote it down, it was, um, Will Bosey did the commentary for the semifinals with Sean, with uh, Charlie Bosco, and then the finals was... It was Katja Kadic and Gregor, Gregor Vrosnik, yeah. Yeah, Gregor Vazonic. and I thought they did a good job too, so the comment, in, in terms of my grade, the, the pros would be that I thought the commentary was good, the stream, the quality was good, uh, something we said last week also applied here, which it, was that it was a nice mix of newcomers and established veterans, right? You had Yanya, you had Andra, 
but you also had um, some new Japanese competitors. You also had, um, let's see, uh, Anji Park, right, was mm. kind of a newer face for the finals. So that was good. That was all good. The cons, a couple things. First of all, if we're really nitpicking, I'll get into the kind of the nitpicky stuff first, and then Do we'll it. pan out. The nitpicky stuff, the finals took a while to start. Um, yeah, they did, Charlie actually. Bosco actually even mentioned this on commentary. Mm-hmm. He yeah. was kind of like, we're not sure why they haven't started yet. And those are the times when, you know, you're just sitting there like with your coffee in front of your laptop, just like twiddling your thumbs. Yeah. Um, so that was, it loses a little bit for that. Uh, the route setting, we've already been over it in detail. The criteria that I gave for setting route setting last week, what I want out of it is number one, good separation, um, which we didn't really have consistently throughout the competition, right? There were moments when they, they weren't, the competitors weren't very, very well separated. Uh, good surprises. Mm, I don't know. Would you say there were any surprises with the route setting? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't want to say surprises, but nothing like impressed me. I, aside from okay. the problems I already mentioned, there were no like brain melting problems. And and then the, the, the route setting, I, it's great if it can steer the narrative so it kind of comes down to the either comes down to the last competitor or at least kind of ups the ante with each competitor. Right. Mm-hmm. And it kind of did that. Like, I think the route setting for me loses some points for the separation and the lack of surprises. Uh, just like I just compared to especially last week. And then another reason why I graded it a C plus. I can't remember if this was something you mentioned, but there was no water cooler moment for lack of a better sure. word uh, I, I think that you might have coined that last week or maybe at some point we've well, talked yeah, about whatever. it whatever just something you're going to talk about on monday yeah yeah i mean think about at mayringen it feels like the whole week afterwards people were talking about andra just doing you know because he's a well-known name mm-hmm. in kind of the mainstream um they were talking about him they were talking about the route setting with the hand jam there was just a lot of stuff that was transcending that weekend it was carrying over into the week yeah and i don't i don't see waking up this morning and looking on twitter and instagram i don't see people kind of buzzing about really these kind of isolated moments or isolated incidents from the competition like they were last week it just did not it did not seem to have that water color water water color moment water cooler (laughs) it didn't have that it just doesn't have that the buzz that the first one did. Maybe we were spoiled by starting off the, the season so strong with Mayringen. I, Maybe. Um, but yeah, I may, I, I can't give it a B. I got to give it a C plus. As I was thinking about, you know, cause we talked about what kind of grading system we were going to use for these. And I said, we should do the letter grades. It made me realize that we should at some point address our perspective of letter grades, like from our childhood, like what was a bad grade to our parents and what was a good grade? Because it turns out we might have like totally different understandings of, uh, of what it is we're saying. But, uh, but yeah, we'll talk about that later. We'll do a confessional and talk about all of our childhood school traumas. Yeah. That'll be be in the off season of the, yeah. Right. But it's, it sounds like, I mean, we were, maybe we graded a little differently, but we kind of had this similar criticisms of, and praise for the different aspects of the yeah. competition. Yeah. You know. Anyway, we are going to shut her down next week. Uh, no, not next week. Two weeks from now, we're going to Chongqing, China for another bouldering and speed roll cup. So another three solid days and presumably with some like hellish wake up times or maybe just yes. staying up super late. Um, one thing I was really missing is I was super disappointed that um, they're like, I, it's really bothering me now that there isn't live chat for the streams Mm -hmm. so i think i'm gonna um and it's probably just gonna be myself in the room but i think i'm gonna put a live video up on this channel starting at the same time as the chongqing finals um with no video playing but we're just gonna have a live chat so pop out the chat window from my video watch the ifsc thing and we can have just like a separate stream of just people that are really interested in how the World Cup works and how the climbing goes. So uh, if you're already subscribed, I'm sure it'll come up on your thing, but we'll make just a stupid little uh, hold screen for it and we can all hang out in the chat and bother each other. And uh, yeah, we'll have a good time. We'll get the the memes rolling. So speed on the 26th, I'm pretty sure that's a Friday. Boulder qualities should be on Saturday and then semis and finals on Sunday. But again, removed by like 12 hours so it could be totally different days uh but yeah yeah and the, um, and the stream is always it, it always seems to kind of give 
it's always questionable. You in never China. know in China. So. It's the one that always uh, that always can crush the live stream. So we'll see what yeah. happens. Uh, but anyway, yeah, if you have any uh, questions or comments, please leave them. Uh, hit us up on the social media if you have any uh, anything you want to say. And of course, we'll be back in two weeks. John, thanks so much for doing. I realize I didn't even introduce you at the start of the show. I don't. Oh, think. that's all right. We, we had too much. We wanted to jump into it and get into it right away. So. Didn't prove it. That's John Bergman. Make sure you read his write up uh, at climbing.com. I'll post the link in the description like I did last week. Uh, and then uh, also check out uh, the YouTube channel beta root setting because they do really good like in-depth root setting and movement analysis uh, for the finals. And I think they've already posted a video for the qualifiers recap. Uh, he's doing a really cool job over there. So make sure you check them out. Otherwise, yeah, there was also, I wanted to say this real fast. I'm glad you mentioned that. There's another uh, Instagram account. I think his name, I think it's Chalked Climber, Chalked.Climber. Um, and he did an interesting video uh, a, a couple of, like a week ago maybe, where he miked somebody that was on the that was actually climbing and it was uh, uh, right after you and I had said that one interesting thing would be if um if the IFSC would start m miking the kind of the wall so you oh, could hear yeah. the, the, the slap of, of the hands and yeah. the, you know like the, the grunts and groans and all that um I think just kind of serendipitously he just happened to post a video on his account where he was um where he kind of did some sound uh, he really miked somebody up that was on the wall. I think it, I think it was chalked climber. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. I'll take a look. I, I know somebody did comment back to me about that too, saying that they wanted to try putting like a, they were actually talking about putting a, like a lav mic in a chalk bag and seeing what kind of noises that picked up. And of course my, my suggestion is actually just hang a shotgun mic from over the top of the wall. I think that would be the best sound, but Hey, if people are trying stuff, that's really cool. Keep on messing around with it. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of room for improvement, I think, with uh, audio of competitions. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah man. Anyway, let's wrap it up there. Thanks All so right. much, John. And we'll see the rest of you guys uh, two weeks from now in Chongqing. See you later. Sounds good. See you, Tyler. <laughs>